Hello friends, welcome to e Shala. This is Dr. Bharti Garg, Assistant Professor from the Department of Public Administration, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Friends, in this module, we are going to discuss about the institutional arrangements made in India for ensuring transparency in the functioning of government. Friends, for a welfare democratic state, it is very important that the government ensures transparency in its functioning. It, it is very important that the government in its services and in its service delivery must be simple, moral, accountable, responsive and transparent. But unfortunately, Indian administration has not maintained its integrity in these decades since independence. It is mired by corruption. It is mired by lack of transparency. There is all over secrecy in the functioning of the government. Since independence, the government has set up various institutional mechanisms to ensure transparency in its functioning. Various institutions have been set up to ensure non-corrupt practices in the government so that administration remains transparent. Three such important institutions are Central Vigilance Commission, Comptroller and Auditor General of India and Central Information Commission which has been set up by the government and which work relentlessly to ensure simple, moral, accountable, responsive and transparent administration in India. In this module, we are going to discuss about these three august institutions in our country and how they are functioning to ensure transparent administration in the country so that there is effective and best service delivery to the masses. The objectives of the module are to understand the inextricable link between transparency and accountability, to discuss the role and functions of Controller and Auditor General of India, to describe the nature of Central Vigilance Commission and to analyze the role and working of Central Information Commission. Governance implies effective management of public resources, high level of accountability, transparency and a free flow of information, control of corruption. Significant citizen participation and equity are the quintessential principles of democratic institutions. Since around 1990s, transparency became a maxim for national governments, international institutions and civil society groups around the world and is widely recognized as core principle of good governance. Free access to information which is timely, relevant, accurate and complete is a key constituent in promoting transparency. Transparency and accountability in government are mutually reinforcing. Now what is transparency? A transparent political regime is one that provides accurate information about itself, its operations and the country as a whole or permits that information to be collected and made available. Transparency is a tool to facilitate the evaluation of public institutions and the information provided accounts for their performance. An organization's transparency can be measured by the depth of assess it allows the depth of knowledge about processes it is willing to reveal and the attention to citizen response it provides. Transparency as a concept covers event transparency, process transparency, real-time transparency and retrospective transparency. Simply put, a transparent political regime is one that provides accurate information about itself, its operations and the country as a whole or permits that information to be collected and made available. Transparency and accountability are reciprocally supporting. The term accountability encapsulates three main elements. Answerability, enforcement and responsiveness. Transparency of information is instrumental for demanding accountability and for motivating citizens to exercise voice power. That is the capacity of citizens to pressurize the frontline officials in ensuring effective delivery of services. Thus, greater transparency leads to more empowerment which in the context of more participation amplifies voice and the assertion of voice results in greater accountability. Despite these linkages, scholars such as Jial and Fox argue that while transparency is an important constituent for securing accountability, the link between the two is neither unassailable nor automatic. Further, the exercise of voice which is seen as a critical element for cementing this relationship is conditioned by various factors. 
transparency of information while providing the opportunities and the material basis for the exercise of voice is not sufficient in impelling citizens to pressurize officials in demanding the effective delivery of services. There are various bodies in place for ensuring transparency and accountability. At the federal level, key institutions include the Central Vigilance Commission, which is an investigative agency, the Office of the Comptroller and Auditor General, which is the financial oversight body, and the Chief Information Commission, which we will discuss in this chapter. These independent agencies increase the ability to commit to desirable policies and increase transparency in the sense that specialization makes the agent responsible more easily identifiable. Now we are going to discuss about Central Vigilance Commission. Anti-corruption measures of the central government are a responsibility of Administrative Vigilance Department in the Department of Personnel and Training, Central Bureau of Investigation, Vigilance Units in the Ministries and Departments of Government of India, Central Public Enterprises and other autonomous organizations, the Disciplinary Authorities and the Central Vigilance Commission. The Administrative Vigilance Division which was set up in the Ministry of Home Affairs in August 1955 to serve as a central agency to assume overall responsibility for anti-corruption measures. With the establishment of the Central Vigilance Commission, a good part of the functions performed by the Administrative Vigilance Division are now exercised by the Central Vigilance Commission. In pursuance of the recommendations made by the Committee on Prevention of Corruption, popularly known as Santhanam Committee, the Central Vigilance Commission was set up by Government of India by a resolution in 1964. Consequent upon the judgment of the Supreme Court in Vineet Narayan v. Union of India case, the Commission was accorded a statutory status in 1998 through Central Vigilance Commission Ordinance 1998. Subsequently, the CVC bill was passed by both Houses of Parliament in 2003 and since that day, it has acquired the statutory status under the Central Vigilance Commission Act 2003. The terms of the provisions made in the CVC's Act, the Commission consists of Central Vigilance Commissioner who is a chairperson and not more than two Vigilance Commissioners who are the members. The Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners are appointed by the President for a term of four years or till they attain the age of 65 years, whichever is earlier. The Commission is deemed to be a civil court for the purposes of Section 195 and Chapter 26 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 and every proceeding before the Commission is to be a judicial proceeding within the meaning of Sections 193 and 228 and for the purposes of Section 196 of the IPC. The task of the CVO is not limited to interfering after faults and inaccuracies have been committed. The foremost object of his office is to thwart slip-ups occurring due to following reasons which are also causes of corruption. Administrative delays, government taking upon themselves more than what they can manage, scope for personal discretion in the exercise of powers, and last is cumbersome procedures of dealing with various matters which are of importance of citizens in their day-to-day -day affairs. The role of this chief vigilance office may broadly be divided into two parts that is preventive and punitive. The chief vigilance officers have so far been concentrating mainly on the punitive side. While detection and punishment of corruption and other malpractices is certainly important, what is even more imperative is the taking of preventive measures which could lessen the number of vigilance cases considerably through the proactive approach by the CVC is the call of the day seeing the glaring misconduct set within the system. Information about corruption, malpractices or misconduct comes to the Central Vigilance Office from diverse sources like Report of Parliamentary Committees, Estimates Committee, Public Accounts Committee and the Committee on Public Undertakings and Audit Reports, Proceedings of the two Houses of Parliament and Complaints and Allegations appearing in the press. Improving vigilance administration is possible only if system improvements are made to prevent the possibilities of corruption and encourage a culture of honesty. Keeping this in view in exercise of the powers conferred on the CVC by Section 8 Clause 1 Sub Clause H of CVC Ordinance 98 and Section 8 1 Sub Clause G of CVC Ordinance 99, the Commission issued instructions for compliance in exercising superintendence over the vigilance administration. 
Now I am going to discuss about Comptroller and Auditor General of India. The office of the Comptroller and Auditor General is the apex auditing body in India and has played a key role in the functioning of the financial committees of parliament and the state legislatures. The CAG has to ascertain whether monies shown in the accounts as having been disbursed were legally available for and applicable to the service or the purpose to which they have been applied or charged and whether the expenditure conforms to the authority which governs it. The constitution enables the independent and unbiased nature of audit by the CAG by providing appointment by the President of India, special procedure for removal like a Supreme Court judge, salary and expenses are charged which are not voted and lastly cannot hold any other government office after his term expires. Today the scope of CAG is not just limited to the financial affairs but has increased significantly encompassing in it the objective of controlling corruption, preventing wasteful government expenditure and fostering excellence in the public sector. The reports of the CAGI have revealed many financial irregularities suggesting a lack of monitoring of public expenses, poor targeting and corrupt practices in many branches of government. The most recent example is its report on 2G scam and coal allocation scam that nailed the corrupt organizing committee members and government representatives. The duties of the CAGI are to audit and report upon all receipts into and spending from the offer coffers called the Consolidated Fund of the Union and State Governments, all transactions relating to the emergency expenses called contingency funds and relating to the monies of public held by the government, for example, postal savings, Vikas Patras at central as well as state levels, all stores and stock accounts of all government offices and departments, accounts of all government companies and corporations, for example, ONGC, sale, etc., accounts of all autonomous bodies and authorities receiving government money, for example, municipal bodies, IITs, and IIMs. Accounts of any body or authority on request of the president or governor or on his own initiative. CAG has the power to inspect any office or organization subject to his audit. It has the power to examine all transactions and question the executive. It has the power to call for any records, papers, documents from any audited entity. And it has the power to decide the extent and manner of audit. Depending upon the objective of audit, we can classify audits by the CAGI into compliance audit or transaction audit in which some selected transactions of an entity for a particular financial year are chosen for examination. Financial attest audit in which CAGI certifies how far the accounts are true and fair. Performance audit. After issue of performance auditing guidelines in 2004, performance audit has become a major activity of the audit department and most of the stakeholders including the public accounts committee have shown increased interest in such reports in view of comprehensive insight provided by them into the economy, efficiency and effectiveness of operations of the government. Now what happens to the audit reports? The constitution under article 151 prescribes that the reports of CAGI relating to accounts of the union or states shall be submitted to the president or governor and is then to be laid before each house of parliament or state legislature. As regards government companies and corporations, CAGI is required to submit his reports to the central or state government concerned who shall cause the reports to be laid before each house of parliament or state legislature as the case may be. Nearly 100 reports are prepared every year by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India for presentation to Parliament or state legislatures. Quite often, despite the reports being sent to the President or Governor or Central Government well in time, before commencement of the Parliament or Assembly session, the reports are not placed in Parliament or state legislature immediately. Government takes considerable time in getting necessary approvals for tabling of audit reports. In many cases, government places the reports towards the end of parliament or assembly sessions or on the last day of the session, thus denying adequate opportunity to the legislature to take cognizance of the CAGI's reports and raise relevant issues in the parliament or assembly. Such serious delays or sometimes manipulations on the part of government in deciding timing of placement of the reports before the legislature erode the independence of the CAG as well as his effectiveness as constitutional watchdog of public finances. Once tabled in the house, the reports stand permanently referred to the central and state standing committees on public accounts or committees on public undertakings. 
These specialized committees have been constituted to facilitate timely and intensive scrutiny of the annual accounts and the audit reports thereon. The committees select those findings and recommendations from CAG reports that they judge to be the most critical to public interest and arrange for hearings on them. At the hearings of the committees, the executive can be called to account for their actions or inactions. Based on their examination, the committees prepare and submit their reports to the legislature that summarize the committee's hearings, the action taken by the executive and include recommendations to improve administrative practices and procedures. Qualitatively, audit provides many tangible and intangible benefits. Audit presence has a deterrent and preventive effect on financial lapses. Audit reports provide an analysis of the financial health of the union and state governments based on time series data so that the respective governments can draw appropriate lessons and take corrective action. At the instance of audit, many changes in policy, law and rules are made by various departments at the union or state levels to avoid recurrence of similar irregularities. These make services more efficient, improve revenue collection and strengthen management of resources. But what action is taken on audit reports? The scrutiny of the annual accounts and the audit reports thereon by the parliament as a whole is an arduous task considering their diverse and specialized nature besides imposing excessive demands on the limited time available to the parliament for discussion of issues of national importance. Therefore, the parliament and the state legislatures have for this purpose constituted specialized committees like the Public Accounts Committee and the Committee on Public Undertakings to which these audit reports and annual accounts automatically stand referred. The reports of CAGI are not just a collection of statistics, rather they also suggest the steps which can be used to improve a situation and rectifying the errors of the past. For instance, CAG with the task of improving the social audit process in NG Narega following reports of malpractices and corruption recommended in March 2011 to the states to set up directorates to train auditors from civil society. As per CAGI's recommendations, a nominee of the government auditor would be present in social audits that Gram Sabhas would conduct twice a year. However, existing mandate of CAG in respect of bodies and authorities does not permit him to conduct a comprehensive whole of the program audit and leaves out a large number of bodies and authorities and substantial amount of funds outside the purview of CAG's audit. It is felt that expenditure and receipt cannot be the core guiding principle for determining CAG's audit mandate with respect to regulators. The regulators discharges executive functions which were earlier performed by the governments. Though their own expenditure or receipt may be negligible, their decisions can have serious impact on the revenue receipts of the government and also on the cost and quality of service provided to the common public. Now friends, we are going to discuss about the Chief Information Commission. The promulgation of Right to Information Act 2005 set the stage for the transparency in the functioning of the government and its various agencies. Under this act, access to information from a public agency has become a statutory right of every citizen. In its enactment, it had been argued that the system of government in India is so opaque that ordinary citizens do not have much information about how decisions are made and how public resources are utilized. In effect, RTI Act is a vehicle for greater transparency about the manner of functioning of public agencies. There have been some major gains in disclosure of information as reported in media and research from time to time. The Act comprises a single piece of legislation to be implemented by the central and state governments of India throughout the entire country at all levels of government. The fact that the same law will be supported by different sets of rules in each jurisdiction and will not be coordinated by a single nodal ministry leads to complications. As such, coordination is an important issue which information commissions as champions of openness under the Act need to constantly facilitate and promote as implementation and application of the law progresses. The Chief Information Commission was established in 2005 and came into operation in 2006. Information commissions sit at crossroads between the rights of the public and the duties of officials. As such, it is essential that their judgments are consistent, well justified and can stand up to scrutiny by the courts, the public and officials. At a minimum, 
all decision notices need to be collected internally into a central database so that commissioners and staff can easily refer back to previous decisions. Decisions need to be collected and filed even if they are issued summarily as a short order as well as when they involve complex legal points and take the form of more detailed judgments. State information commissions have also been set up thus giving practical shape to the 2005 RTI Act. It is expected that the CIC that is the Central Information Commission will help spread the culture of public seeking information under the RTI and expose wrongdoings. One of the Information Commission's most important roles is to handle appeals and complaints made under the Act. While an internal appeals mechanism is available as an inexpensive first opportunity under Section 19 Clause 1, oversight by Information Commissions which are independent of government is one of the most important safeguards included in the Act to ensure compliance with the law. By setting strong precedents in favor of openness, the Information Commissions operate to tackle entrenched cultures of secrecy that may continue to impact on openness under the Act. When handling cases, it is important that Information Commissions keep in mind the law's objective of promoting open government via maximum disclosure of information. In this context, it is important to recognize that the passage of the RTI Act symbolizes the government's recognition that information disclosure is in the public interest. Section 19 Clause 10 of the Act specifically requires that information commissions and or the government notal agencies are responsible for administering the RTI Act and they will need to develop rules which provide more detail on how an appeal will be made and processed. Some jurisdictions have already promulgated appeal rules. Section 18 Clause 1 gives information commissions a very broad power to consider issues not only regarding disclosure but regarding the calculation of fees, forms of access, imposing penalties and awarding compensation. Section 24 Clause 1 also gives information commissions a role in determining when information should be released by intelligence or security agencies exempted under this section where it is claimed that the information sought is in respect of allegations of violations of human rights. As a consequence of the breadth of the oversight powers of information commissions, internal procedural guidelines also need to address the different challenges that are thrown up by the different types of cases the commissions will handle. Section 19 Clause 5 of the Act specifically places the burden of proving that withholding information was justified onto the official who denied the request. In practice, this means that a requester only needs to interact with the commission after the official withholding the information has first been questioned because the burden is on the official to show the commission that they were not wrong. It is essential that the information commission remains user-friendly and does not turn into another overly legal forum which is dominated by lawyers. Although the Commission does have the powers of a civil court under Section 18 Clause 3 of the Act, nonetheless the Commission is not expected to operate like a court. It is important that information commissions can be easily utilized by any member of the public, not just those who can afford sophisticated legal representation. In the event that officials engage legal counsel, the Information Commission as an openness champion needs to be proactive in ensuring that arguments in favor of disclosure are not overlooked simply because the requester is not present or has not used a lawyer. This approach focuses on ensuring that fundamental constitutional rights to information is properly enforced rather than simply turning hearings into a competition as to which party has the resources and skills to make a better argument. Most importantly, Section 19 Clause 8 includes a catch-all phrase which enables information commissions to require the public authority to take any such steps as may be necessary to secure compliance with the provisions of this Act. This clause, when combined with Section 19 Clause 7, which makes it explicit that the decisions of the central and state commissions are binding, makes it clear that commissions have the statutory clout to be strong champions of openness and accountability, if they choose to exercise their decision-making powers, keeping in view the objectives and spirit of the law. It is expressed that a matter of concern in the Act is that currently it contains no time limit for the disposal of appeals by the Information Commission, whereas Section 19 Clause 6 requires departmental appellate authority to dispose of appeals within 30 to 45 days. 
ideally the same time limit of 30 to 45 days given to the departmental appellate authorities and the section 19 clause 6 should be adopted by the information commissions International best practice supports the establishment of a legal unit or at least the employment of a legal expert which will vet all decisions before they are issued to ensure that they accord with the Act and common law generally. For example, the Act contains exemptions for information available to a person in his fiduciary relationship, disclosures which would constitute a contempt of court and trade secrets and intellectual property, all of which are terms which have agreed legal meanings. It is important that commissions take account of how these terms have already been interpreted by courts. Section 25 clause 3 specifically requires that information commissions produce annual reports. Through their annual reports, information commissions can provide a holistic picture of the status of compliance with the Act. They can highlight areas of good and bad practice, lessons learned and innovations which could be replicated. They can also pinpoint areas for reform. They also provide an important opportunity to draw attention to RTI implementation issues. The statistics collected in the annual report can be an important monitoring tool for heads of public authorities, nodal agencies and the information commissions to regularly assess whether authorities are meeting their obligations under the Act. They can also be used to identify any public authorities which perhaps require additional training or system support, for example, because statistics show that they are regularly missing deadlines for disposing of applications or appeals. At the time the annual report is tabled in Parliament, information commissions could issue a press release summarizing the highlights and setbacks in terms of implementation which are discussed in the report. Publicly will be an important means of encouraging governments to take action to address implementation deficiencies. In keeping with the strong proactive disclosure requirements in the Act at Section 4, annual reports should also be available for inspection at every office of every public authority so that all members of the public can easily find out how well the Act is being implemented. It is important that all awareness raising and implementation strategies take account of the local needs of communities as this will make it more likely that the public will feel ownership of the RTI and will recognize its relevance to their daily lives. In this context, experience has shown that strategies which promote government-community implementation partnerships can be particularly useful. Right to Information Councils is one mechanism for promoting more community engagement with the Act. In other jurisdictions, information commissions have also set up government civil society advisory committees drawing together representatives from civil society, the private sector and the media with officials and commission staff to make recommendations for improvements and identify gaps in implementation and assess in practice. This can also be a useful means of catalyzing civil society organizations to undertake their own public awareness activities as they will feel that they have a more direct stake in ensuring that implementation efforts are effective. In India, civil society groups have already been extremely active throughout the country in raising awareness of the Act and their efforts could usefully be supported and endorsed by information commissions. But the experiences of ordinary citizens in most villages, towns and districts of this country have not always been very positive. A recent study by Priya on implementation of RTI Act in 12 states concluded information about the designated public information officers was not available in 90% of the districts. Nearly half of all respondents felt that PIOs were not at all cooperative in giving information even when asked. Self-disclosure mandated under Section 4 of the RTI Act was not made in 90% of the districts in the study. One of the key provisions of this Act is self-disclosure of information in public domain. It is assumed that if adequate information is available, citizens can demand services and claim rights due to them from appropriate authorities and officials. The status of this self-disclosure is rather poor nationwide. Transparency is necessary for making the system of public service delivery effective. It enables information in the hands of the citizens in a manner that they may be able to claim their entitlements. However, mere knowledge of what entitlements are and who is responsible for fulfilling them is not enough in ensuring that public services are adequately and effectively delivered to the intended beneficiaries. 
to conclude this module friends i would like to say that the very existence of central vigilance commission comptroller and auditor general of india and the central information commission ensures a transfer of regime from secrecy to transparency these institutions are ensuring maximum transparency in the working of the government so that citizens get to know where their monies are being spent and try to ensure that there are corrupt free practices in administration these august institutions in our country have been ensured maximum independence from the influence of the executive it is their independent functioning free from executive influences that creates most respect in the eye of a public it is very important that these institutions keep a vigilant eye on corrupt practices financial impropriety and there should be maximum information in the public domain these institutions through their functioning are ensuring that welfare also reaches to the masses by keeping all the information in the public domain and ensuring that the finances are put to best use and there is a best performance by the government agencies so friends i would like to say that it is very important that government should work towards the strengthening of these institutions so that we have a smart government in our country smart government means simple moral accountable responsive and transparent government so it is very important and it is very necessary that these institutions should continue to function in an independent manner free from any kind of influences and pressures to ensure good governance in our country thank you